Good evening and welcome to the Greening Greenfield and Racial Justice Rising discussion following the joint showing of the award-winning film Mossville When Great, Great, Great Trees Fall. My name is Louise Amio and before we get started with this evening's events, I would like to introduce my fellow Film Cuts Committee members besides Dorothy McIver and me. Emily Green has served as both the brains and the brawn of this event, managing everything from getting the film to the invitations to the Zoom connections and lots, lots more. It is also important to acknowledge that this program is made possible by grants from New Salem and Amherst Cultural Councils, as well as ongoing support from other cultural councils and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. We thank them all for their support of our work. As we begin, I would like to attend to a few housekeeping matters. First, please be sure to mute yourself. That's the icon on the lower left of your screen that looks like a microphone. Please ensure that there is a red line running through it so that no sounds from your house will distract from the event. When we will get to the Q&A, excuse me, um, if you will please click on speaker view at the top right hand corner of your screen, you will be able to see the speaker, Marty Nathan, who I'll introduce in a moment, and her slides. Um, and if you want to be seen um, afterwards when we get to Q&A, you will want to unlock the video camera down on the left next to the microphone icon. And all of your questions should be posted in the Q&A, which again is a button or whatever uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, a question will be answered to Marty or to everyone, and that will be your choice. Again, please make sure that you are muted and that you have crossed out the microphone on the lower left. Thank you. We will start tonight with a very moving song written by Peter Hamill and sung by Adam Matlock. Adam is an accordionist, vocalist, composer, and educator living in New Haven, Connecticut. He is working on a second opera about the Greenwood Massacre in 1921. Many of you will recognize that he is the son of Gloria Matlock, a notable, a notable musical talent of her own. I believe you should have recent, excuse me, I believe you should have received the lyrics to the song for those of you who would like to follow along. In any case, it is a song that we think expresses the justifiable anger and frustration of a people that has been denied the promises of equality and opportunity at every turn from our country's founding. Please take a listen.
burning hatred of race, sex, religion, color, country, and creed. These scream from the pages of everything I read. You just bring me oppression and torture, apartheid, corruption, and pain. You just bring me the rape of the planet and joke well right at the hate. Oh, someday the millennium, but how far is someday? Thank you, Adam, for that moving rendition. I wish the sound had been a little bit clearer, but thank you very much for doing it so well. We all hope, I'm sure, to be part of the awakening of racial justice in our nation and soon. And now it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, the incomparable Dr. Marty Nathan, Martha Marty Nathan. Marty's roots are in North Carolina, where her first husband and four friends were murdered by Klansmen and Nazis in the 1979 Greensboro massacre and where she worked for years to reveal official complicity with white supremacists, leaving as a legacy the Markham Nathan Fund for Social Justice. She recently retired as a family doctor who in her work at Brightwood Health Center in Springfield helped found the Klinikita Fund for the Healthcare of Undocumented Workers. She is a regular columnist about climate justice and a founder of Climate Action Now, Springfield Climate Justice Coalition, and a Northampton group dedicated to finding, fighting climate change called Two Degrees. She is married to Elliot Fratkin and has three inspiring children and two grandchildren. Please remember to post your questions to Marty in the Q&A um, so that we can manage them afterwards, make sure there are no duplicates and hopefully everyone will get heard. And now the incomparable Marty Nathan. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Felipe. Um, I really appreciate being asked to do this tonight. It is a, a great honor for me uh, to be talking about people in a town who showed just extraordinary courage, resourcefulness, and suffered so much because of what they were up against in Mossville. Um, they, they're at one point in the movie, they said, how many more Mossvilles do we need before we say enough is enough? And I think that the song just answered the question for most of us. We need the future now and we have to create it. Uh, what we saw in the movie was illustrated was environmental racism and classism, environmental injustice. And what I'm going to say to you tonight is that environmental injustice is the rule rather than the exception throughout the country and throughout our industrial history. Classical environmental injustice, that sounds like it should be, you know, in history 101 or something, uh, but it involves a poor and disempowered community, usually black indigenous people of color or BIPOC, 
which is forced to endure the stealing of their land, the polluting of their air, water, and soil, leading to the destruction of their health, their livelihood, and their community. The Moss film mu movie illustrated that exceptionally well. The toxic structure or structures that is forced on these uh, on this community because of its lack of an economic and political clout to resist or to fight the siding uh, occurs because uh, of its lack of economic and political resources to resist or to fight the siding of the factory, refinery, dump site, pipeline, or highway in its midst or right next door. The carrot that is usually given to the community is jobs. I've heard that word so many times in these struggles, but that carrot is usually rotten because toxic exposure actually affects the health of workers first, even before the community. And frontline and fence line communities ultimately suffer so much financially due to the plummeting of their property values that there's no financial gain from the jobs. For environmental injustice to occur, it, and this is another important point, uh, for environmental injustice to occur, it has to be backed up by lack of government regulations and often actually by the opposite, which are incentives for the industry that is moving in, usually tax breaks and waivers that sweeten the deal. Now, I would like to somehow put up my slides here. Uh, tell me if it works. Is it, it doesn't seem to be working. No. Not yet. What, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> Marty, Marty, did you do screen share? I did. You did do the screen share. I, I put share screen. Yeah. And I, oh, I see what I need to do. Ah, did that <laughs> work? Thank yes. you. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for, with your patience. Old lady on a Zoom call, dangerous thing. Uh, let me see if I get, well, I'll just look at this. Um, pollution exposure in our country. Um, comes by way of race and class. Um, here we're talking about race. Um, these are La Latinos suffer 63% more pollution than they produce. Black people in our country suffer 50% more pollution than they produce. And white folks are exposed to 17% less pollution than they produce. Worldwide, the, and this, is, this has to do with class, wealth, riches. The richest 10% of the people produce 50% of the pollution and the poorest 50% produce 10% of the, of the pollution. And the in between 40% produce their 40%. Uh, poor po people pollute the least, but suffer, suffer one and a half times the exposure in Minnesota. And, of, and then race plays a further card. Indigenous and communities of color suffer twice the rate of exposure. This is just in one state. I know we've flown in from worldwide to one state in the Midwest. And 
Environmental racism has multiple aspects and it's long-term and comprehensive on its, in its effect on communities. Race is the most significant predictor of a person living near contaminated air, water, or soil. 56% of the population near toxic waste sites are people of color, way out of proportion to their numbers in the community. 95% uh, of their claims against polluters are denied by the EPA. Once again, going to the, the collusion between government and polluters, particularly when it has to do with um, uh, powerless communities. 38% um, uh, people of color have 38% nitrogen dioxide exposure and are twice as likely to live without potable water and modern sanitation. So let's get out, uh, we can. Um, I've been involved in supporting the movement for environmental justice for more than 40 years. And it was interesting because when I was asked to do this, it forced me to look back on things that happened long ago that I had not thought about for a very long time, at least 15 years. Um, my first involvement with environmental racism was in the late 1970s the state of North Carolina trade, tried to create a PCB, polychloride biphenyls. Um, they're cancer-causing uh, materials that are used in electronics, um, and they're manufactured in the South. And the state of North Carolina wanted to create a PCB dump site in Warren County, North Carolina, which was right near where my husband and I were living. Well, it, Warren County just happened to be both the poorest and the blackest county in the state of North Carolina, just by happenstance. Mike and I lived in Durham and we supported the demonstrations against putting cancer causing chemicals in the ground in Warren County. We all ultimately lost that fight. In the 1990s and early 2000s, we, a small anti-racist foundation called the Greensboro Justice Fund that grew out of the, the uh, court cases that found the city of Greensboro responsible for Michael's death. The Greensboro Justice Fund granted to fight racism in the South um, and ultimately became more and more deeply involved in environmental racism. I'm gonna just pick up a few of the groups that we funded because they were just, they really drew us in and became long-term friends. The one with the greatest name was called Jesus People Against Pollution in Columbia, Mississippi. It was, a black cre uh, it was created in a black community in response to an explosion at a local chemical plant that resulted in severe exposure of the community to toxic substances. And they fought for compensation and to be moved to a, a place of their choice for years and years and spread out, got involved in other things, other industrial exposures that they truly believe were ca causing other forms of illness in the community. Then there was the Concerned Citizens League of America Environmental Justice Group in Bradley Junction, Florida which fought against the destruction wrought in their poor rural community, almost entirely black, by phosphate mining, and then a plan to uh, turn the county into a toxic dumping site so that Florida could meet the EPA demands for a statewide toxic waste plan. Another one with a great name that you may have heard of is the Newtown Florist Group. 
the story behind uh, uh, Florist Club, excuse me. They're in Gainesville, Georgia, and they still exist. Uh, in 1936, a tornado swept through Gainesville and housing for black people, segregated housing was built on the other side of the raid, railroad tracks um, where industrial development moved in. The new town ladies formed in the 1950s, the Florist Club for, uh, for me with members caring for the sick and the dead, buying flower flowers for community funerals. Well, as they went to the funerals and presented the flowers, they began to notice that people were dying of the same things, mouth and throat cancers. And they became convinced that the toxic pollution from the industrial development in their little community was making people sick. So the Newtown Florist Club switched from flowers to fighting, although they had already been involved in the civil rights struggle of the struggles of the 70, 60s and 70s. Uh, then there's the Kingsport Citizens Committee for a Cleaner Environment in Cl Kingsport, Tennessee that was put together by people who were just sick and tired of the unbridled industrial growth in their town and the air pollution in the poor neighborhoods of this Appala Appalachian, Tennessee city. This one was a little bit different because it was, uh, the group was mainly white and poor. Uh, all the others were based in black communities. So once again, pointing out that this is not just in, uh, environmental racism, but also environmental classism. One of their favorite tactics was a year in which they document, documented the smells of Kingsport which was uh, the smell of benzene and other cancer causing pollutants that filled the air and they had people write them down and submit them. Uh, finally, the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, which actually my husband told me actually showed up, I expected them to in the Mossville film. Um, that was, uh, founded by a woman who had worked in West Africa and found exactly the same thing uh, in terms of environmental racism and classism in Cancer Alley in Louisiana that she had seen in Niger. Um, and she worked with people in the community to themselves document the pollution in their air and water and take the cases to court, take them to the EPA, fight for compensation, fight for um, protection against the pollution. That's Louisiana Bucket Brigade. And also, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Ann Braden, but she's one of the heroes of my life. Uh, she was a lady in Louisville, Kentucky who started the first region-wide environmental racism coalition, the Southern Organizing Coalition for Economic and Social Justice. And I, by this time, was, had convinced myself that, that environmental racism and classism was a thing of the South. Um, little did I know, and we'll get into this later, that, that how wrong I would how wrong I was in that assessment. Uh, but Anne and her friends fought for government intervention and won some buyout, buyouts of destroyed communities and uh, re compensation for people's homes and pulled people together so that they would learn from each other all across the South. Um, I go into some detail about all this because I want to say how widespread it is. It was back this, then. We're talking 1990s and, and early 2000s, and it's actually worse now. Um, as one analyst has stated, you cannot have pollution without a sacrifice zone. I think that's really important to understand Mossville was the sacrifice zone 
for the petroleum and plastics in industry in uh, Southern Louisiana. Uh, in order to make a mega profit, industry has to cite where the neighbors cannot aggressively oppose them through zoning or regulation. And they would not sue for damages. No access to lawyers. It also helps for industry to have access to the low wage unorganized labor that was in Mossville, in Columbia, Mississippi, in Gainesville, Georgia, all these other places that were fence line communities, but also produces, produced the sacrifice workers for the industry. Um, but not only has the crime been the rule, but increasingly, so has the grassroots resistance to it, a resistance that's become stronger and more unified as the decades have gone by. People love their homes. They're, they love their families and their communities. And that uh, love goes deep into our souls. And we will fight to hold on to them intact and unpolluted as the movie showed so, unrelent so relentlessly. In more recent time, the climate movement has arisen and it very soon became smart enough to fuse with, to support the environmental justice movement. It was an obvious and necessary move with one of the most famous efforts being the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline from the tar sands of Alberta and Canada to Cancer Alley in Louisiana. Out of this struggle came the concept of climate justice. Bitter struggles are still going on on the Pine Ridge Sioux Reservation where they have built the Dakota Access Pipeline on Native American lands and have threatened their water with a pipeline going under the Missouri River. Another place that where the action is, is occurring right now is in the Arctic uh, National Wildlife uh, Refuge where people are fighting for the lives and homes of the Gwich'in people in Northern Alaska. You see the air pollution killing people in frontline communities can, can almost never be emitted without concomitant blowing off of CO2, as well as nitrogen, sulfur, ozone, methane, and a host of other greenhouse gases. So pollution and climate pollution nearly always go together. Um, so we who fight the climate emergency have a moral, political, and economic duty to fight the pollution health effects on the local neighborhoods and workers. Mar Marta, Marty, can I interrupt a second? Sure. Can you please slide your for move your slides forward? They're they're not moving forward. I know they're not supposed to yet. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, sorry about that. You better believe that the industries surrounding and invading Massville are also producing a changing climate that will cause sea level rise in Boston. And here we have that synthesis of climate justice. The putting together of fighting climate change and fighting toxic air pollution in poor neighborhoods. Because air pollution and greenhouse gases are often released from the same sources, cutting greenhouse gas emissions in an effort to slow Sorry, climate change also reduces air pollutants, such as fine particulate matter. Reducing these co-emitted air pollutants improves air quality, 
and benefits human health. Um, let's see. The struggles that cli against climate emergency and uh, environmental injustice are further intertwined because the effects of the effects of climate change, not just of the direct pollution, are also more likely to hurt poor people and particularly people of color. Um, here we have a slide about the projected economic damage from climate change in the United States. And what it shows is that the poorest 10%, I'm sorry, you can't see this very well. The poorest 10% who are on the left suffer much worse than the richest 10% from the effects of climate change, which uh, include sea level rise, storms, droughts, um, all uh, fires, all the things that we're seeing these days. We first saw this in Kat Hurricane Katrina when the first real climate change megastorm hit Louisiana. Um, and the levee broke in the Ninth Ward and people died. People are unprotected from the effects of climate change. They are forced to house in the most vulnerable geographic spaces where um, they can be flooded out, they can, they face fire, they face the other effects and they have no transportation. They're less likely to have transportation when storms hit. Um, another classic example is Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico from which we received many refugees in Western Mass. The other thing that has affected us from refugees has been the climate checks, uh, change effects in Central America. There's a, been a drought there ever since 2014, which has been the inciting event uh, for many people to move to the cities and then move, move on up to the United States and more recently getting stopped permanently at the border. And the most recent um, horrible expression of climate injustice has have, have been hurricanes Eta and Iota in Central America. To the left is flooding in Honduras, and to the right, I believe, is Nicaragua with Iota. Um, two Category Five hurricanes augmented by climate change that the people of Central America did not produce, but which hits them because they are vulnerable. But we don't have to look so far to talk about the need to confront climate injustice. Palmer, I'm gonna, sorry. There we go. Um, Palmer Renewable Energy, renewable in quotes, has been trying to build a biomass incinerating power plant in East Springfield for 12 years, only to be knocked down over and over again by resistance led by Arise and uh, the local community, often led by now city councilor Jesse Letterman. Um, this has been going on, we call this the zombie biomass plant because it has been killed and thought was thought to be dead several times in the last 12 years. They were trying to build it and still are in a city that for two years in a row was declared the asthma capital of the country where asthma, which was much worse for poor people, I do not have the, the graph that says how much worse it is for Latinos in Springfield, 
Um, but here we have to the right, a little graph about the incidence by income. Um, Springfield inflicts disease on its people through bad air produced by transportation and by industry. And in this very situation, Palmer Renewable wanted to build a biomass plant to burn wood that would, um, well, first of all, it would come from cutting down the trees in Western Massachusetts, but it would burn wood and then pollute the air in Springfield. Uh, and guess where they wanted, wanted to and want to build it still? It is proposed to go into East Springfield, lo and behold, a low-income, diverse environmental justice community. Surprise, surprise. It will release more nitrous oxides and particulate pollution than coal for each unit of electricity that's produced into a community at very high risk for asthma. That Pollution will not though just stay there in East Springfield, it will spread for 90 miles up beyond Northampton into Greenfield and into Southern Vermont and way down into New Haven and East to Boston. It goes for 90 miles. It does not know, pollution does not know boundaries. So we have an issue in, of environmental injustice that is being rammed through in this instance, by the state. Remember we talked about how government, um, hold on just a second, how uh, government has to support um, any instance of environmental racism or classism? Well, here's exhibit number one, done in the name of all things of fighting climate change. The legislature has taken, taken up combating the climate emergency this session by adopting two very different climate bills, one from the House and one from the Senate. Neither is good enough to meet what we need, but the House bill finally requires municipal light plants, uh, which are publicly owned utilities in places like Holyoke, to cut their greenhouse gas emissions by changing the energy sources to renewables or, here's the catch, to a made up category called non-carbon emitting. But that's a lie. Because they label as non-carbon emitting burning biomass, which actually emits more carbon dioxide per unit electricity produced, then coal, the dirtiest of fossil fuels. They are creating an incentive for these Eastern, much richer and whiter than Springfield municipal communities to buy Palmer renewable energy at a price which will ensure Palmer's profits while no pollution, while it's pollution ensures more asthma deaths in Springfield and ensures all of us more climate change. Um, we have been fighting this now. The community in Springfield has been fighting uh, this now for 12 years. The focus now is on that conference committee that from which should come a climate bill. I ask all of you, it's in the chat. Um, at, at, no, it's not yet in the chat. It will be in the chat. Uh, to call your legislators and ask them, please, to call the conference committee. I will also put the names and the addresses, the email addresses of that conference committee in the chat. And you can write them directly. Many people say they don't like to be bothered, but we say this is a matter of life and death for the people of Springfield. 
them not being bothered is not a bother to us. Um, there is also in the chat, there is an article about the biomass plant. And there's uh, also a petition that you can go to and sign against the biomass plant that will go to uh, the conference committee. Please go and sign it. And I would love to take, to take all of your questions. Thank you, Marty. This has been very, very interesting and very helpful. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Emily, will you take this over? I will, I will. Um, thank you, Marty. And um, once again, I wanna remind people um, to go ahead, if you have a question, um, to go to the Q&A, not the chat, um, and put your questions in. Um, I'm gonna start with a question um, that's in here from uh, Mora, is how, has there been any attempt to sue the companies for damages and get a fair price for the residents' relocation? And I'm assuming you're talking about Mossville. Um, I know no more than what is in um, what is in the movie. Uh, he had a lawyer, and I'm sure many of the people there also had lawyers. I would imagine suits were tried, um, but I don't know the answer to the question. That that's just my assumption. Yeah, one of the things I'll just add, Marty, on um, that I remember was um, he eventually, of course, ended up selling his property and he had to use most of his money on medical expenses. He was hoping to buy this little place in Texas yeah. and he was unable to do that because he was already experiencing the severe pollution in his body which is such a shame. Um, do you know, um, Marty, with the um, plant for the biomass, is it actually up for um, people to, uh, you know, for the state of, or the city of Springfield to go ahead and do it? Or what, what phase are we in at this point? Well, we're just this month, probably. We're at a particular phase, and that's why I put the petition in the chat. <clears throat> the plan okay. will not be fa financially viable if there are no incentives to buy its electricity, because probably its producing its electricity will be more expensive than producing other forms of renewable energy, and it will not, and and so it will not survive. By creating this legislation, which is in the conference committee, the House has given towns the incentive that, that, that Palmer needs to buy that electricity. So, and they are setting up that market even as we speak. Palmer is going around to all the, the richer, whiter municipal light plants in Eastern Massachusetts and said, hey, you can fulfill your Massachusetts uh, uh, obligations to cut greenhouse gases if you buy our Palmer renewable electricity. Here, mm. sign this contract. And some of them have. If, but not enough of them yet. And the main thing is we want to stop that in the legislature because that is incentivizing pollution and climate change. Mm. It is criminal. And our, it, it, it's, our legislator, legislators cannot be doing this. It's counter to science and it's counter to human values. Okay. So um, that will only go on for a month until the beginning of the next session. Then the issue of whether Springfield will allow it to be built. That's an interesting one too. And once hmm. again, you, we see government officials doing shady things with business. Um, 
Palmer Renewable had a permit in the city of Springfield, but the permit actually in writing ran out last year. And we all heaved one more sigh of relief. You know, this is the, the what I was talking about, the zombie biomass. Uh, we thought it was dead. It would never, they could never do this. The permit's gone, okay? But now the, um, the city is saying that at, in actual fact, Palmer Renewable had an oral agreement with them yes. to allow, the, the, to permit the biomass plant. And they're going to let them go ahead, even though there is absolutely nothing in writing. Well, now march out the lawyers, which is what will happen probably very soon. But first, the issue of financing has to be settled by getting rid of or not the language in the climate bill that's in Boston. Do people understand? Does that make any sense? This is so convoluted that you have to, it takes a PhD in craziness to be able to figure it out. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. Uh, this is from Dennis. Is there detailed information about the Palmer plant so I could look it, up, it, uh, look it over? Yes, there is. Please go and uh, I'll try to get in the, in the chat before we leave, but the Climate Action Now website has a whole section with gobs of uh, numbers and, and references. And there's one particularly good article by PFPI, Laura Height, um, that describes uh, the, both the scientific situation and what biomass means, and also the legal and political situation vis-a-vis -vis the legislature. I'm not sure that it deals with this issue of the permit that really expired, but they're now saying didn't expire. I'm not sure that that's there. But the rest of the stuff is there. Just how polluting the biomass is in terms of all the... Um, local pollution, but as well as climate pollution. That's all there, Climate Action Now website. And I would add to that, um, Greenfield, they wanted to uh, build a biomass in Greenfield and the Greenfield community stood up and said no, voted no against it. So it is possible to stop these people. You know, we had, that's what we have to keep reminding ourselves is we do have some power. Um, now I have an anonymous uh, attendee saying, hello, I'm thankful for the, this event and talk. I wonder if there is a way we could see this slideshow again. I can't take it all in right now due to having to multitask and take care of my elderly mother while I'm on this Zoom meeting. Thanks to you, Marty. Um, now the next question is from I, Kate. I can make that make it avail available any way you want. I just slapped this together today. It was a great one, Marty. Um, and this is from Peg. It's not in the chat. If it was put there before we signed on, sometimes that's when we can't see it. Can it be oh, added? Um, our, Peg, I, I'm assuming. Did you give some, um, Marty, did you give some addresses in for things? Yes, I gave oh. two things. One is I'm going to, I I don't know if I can do this. I'm going to get out of share screen, okay? Mm -hmm. um, how, how do I do that? Um, at the very top, <laughs> usually it will say, a little red bar will say stop. Share. Oh, you got it. Got I it. got okay. it. Okay. Thank you. There so you much. are. <laughs> okay. I'm going to see if I can fix that problem. Okay. Uh, one of the things, the other thing is there is a, uh, I, I wrote an article for the um, Valley Advocate and that's linked here. And it, and I got a lot of expert review for it. So I think you can rely on it. Um, and here I just put things in. The first one is the Valley Advocate article. And the oh, second yeah. one 
is the petition. Please go to that petition and sign it and send it to all your friends and get it signed, okay? Great. Um, next uh, is from Dennis. Is there a California style carbon taxing available in Massachusetts? No. People have been trying. I don't think that, car that California has, has uh, carbon tax anyway. I don't think any state in the country does. Uh, British Columbia does. Um, we've been trying for a carbon fee and rebate for quite some time otherwise called putting a fair price on carbon. And uh, the Massachusetts legislature has, is impermeable. Um, it has been an incredibly, whoops, nothing is showing up in my, in my chat. Huh. Uh, it's showing up in my chat. Marty, it's, it's uh, just above where you're, you wrote that. Oh, this is just to all panelists. Ah, yeah. You know what? Let's see. Sorry <laughs> about this, folks. Let's see if I. <laughs> we're all we're all learning to navigate the yeah, this new I'm world not... we're in. <laughs> okay, here she goes. I'm I'm very sorry about that. There it goes. Can you see it, Marty? I I can see it. Eli, you mean? Yeah. Can. Um, otherwise, no. Good. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. From Carol, what guidelines or restrictions should a city have on its books to stop these dangerous proposals from getting to first base? For example, cities should not offer incentives to entice this polluting companies to come. Yes. Um, the way... Ever since Reagan, cities and states have been starved. And so they look for tax money every way they can at the same, and so they see polluting industries as in two ways. First of all, they see them as increasing their tax base, but then they cut into that in order to lure them to their community or the state by waiving fees and taxes. So, um, you know, there should be no incentives for polluting industries. There should be zoning restrictions, air quality restrictions. Um, and um, I'm no expert in those, in this, but those are the two things that I can think of that are really important. Okay. Um, what is the bill in the legislature that we should support or fight? Is that what the petition is about? Yes, it is. And it's 40, House 4933. It passed through the House. It is in con conference committee with the Senate bill. And they're trying to make one bill out of these two very different bills. Uh, and it's the House bill that has the very bad language about biomass being non carbon emitting, which is the big lie. Um, it is carbon emitting and thoroughly polluting. And so we should uh, get our Congress people. I don't know if Natalie has called. Um, I don't know if Natalie has called uh, the conference committee yet um, to demand that they eliminate the language that says that biomass is non-carbon emitting because without that language, the uh, Palmer Renewable cannot build, build uh, the biomass plant in East Springfield. Okay, we've got about two more questions. I just wanna ask you- Are we okay? I can show Adam's video again. Pardon? You wanna show Adam's video again at the end? I found the button that needs to be pressed for the audio. <laughs> That's good. Um, probably this is not. the ending. Mm, well, I'll, I'll see. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Um, <laughs> um, I think the important thing you were talking about, Natalie Blass. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and, and I, there, there are probably people online right now, not from the Greenfield area. It, it does fall your legislators 
and your senators, please, and tell them to con contact the conference committee. Yeah. Uh, very important. Right. Um, and this is from Anonymous again. Since Marty said slideshow can be made available, could you send the link to us? And Marty, um, if you send it to me, I'll be, make sure I get it out to the whole 82 people that saw the movie. Okay, great. I will do. Okay, great, great. Um, and it looks like, does it, does, uh, is there any other question um, coming in? I think um, that may be it. And I just want to thank Marty so much for jumping in and helping us to navigate some, some sense out of this extremely tragic, sad story of Mossville. Um, and for us to realize that it's so important for us to share this with as many people as we can. This is not the only example, as Marty said throughout her, her talk and gave you so many examples of other situations. And we have to remember that if we don't stand up and say something, it'll keep on going on because we live in a capitalist society that promotes the use and misuse and ex, um, extraction of land. Um, Mo Mossville showed us what a real kind, loving community could be and what may be the real salvation for all of us as we face an uncertain future. Now, this is a quote that was sent to me. It's from a, a black woman at a demonstration and it really spoke to me about the whole issue of black and brown communities and racism in this country. It's the quote said, telling me that I am obsessed with talking about racism in America is like telling me I'm obsessed with swimming when I'm drowning. And this is the woman who made, who um, put this on her sign. Um, I'm not, I, I, from what I could understand uh, from Felipe, it may not be her words, but she also felt these were extremely important words. May we remember these words and all of us become obsessed. Um, I do want to thank everybody who's uh, participated with us here um, at this incredible um, chance for us to hear more, learn more from Marty and realize that, that we've got an awful lot of work to do and we have to keep ourselves going and and realize that we have a slither, slither of hope with Biden. You know, we, we're gonna have to push him. We're gonna have to really push him hard to do the right thing. Not only with climate change, but I'm gonna throw in my two cents with foreign policy. But, you know, foreign policy impacts our climate as well. Um, so let's all realize that um, our work is just beginning. And thank you all so much for participating. Bye.